Tylius Troubles, Part 60 Prequel to the Battle of the Via Diocleta Spring, 2403 By the Via Aurelia Captain General Duke Scaringella and his Riemann army marched in the van. As was proper, now they were moving through the outskirts of their own realm. The whole force, Pavonans included, was comprised mostly of foot soldiers, along with considerable baggage and a large artillery train, which one might presume would critically limit their speed, ruining their chances of successfully catching the brute foe ahead. This was not so, however, as both armies were pushing themselves hard, the Bavonans keen to exact revenge for the multitude of insults done to them and theirs by Razga Boldegut's ogres, and the Remans desperate to ensure that their own realm did not suffer a similar fate. Every effort had been made to ensure a good pace, including assigning the Pavonans large Pistolier regiment to assist the artillery's passage in every way they could, even hitching their own mounts to the limbers in rotation. Although their poor horses would doubtless be in no fit state to fight when it came to battle, the brute foe would be subjected to battery by a storm of iron round shot rather than a paltry peppering of leaden pistol balls. Towards the rear of the Riemann column rode the newly elected Arch-Lector of Moor, Bernardo Ugolini. He was accompanied by several servants and clergy, including his Estalian secretary, Duarte, followed by a cart carrying his personal baggage, as well as a small body of Riemann militiamen who had become noticeably more conscientious in their duties now that they were accompanying not merely a lector, but the Holy Father of the entire Church of Moor. The Riemann cross-keyed standard was carried before Bernardo, while off to his side marched a column of iron-clad dwarfen mercenaries who also sported the cross-keys, painted on their shields. These sturdy veterans had served in the miscellaneously mercenary Riemann army for more than a decade, along with the regiments of Cathayans, Empire soldiers, and previously even elves. In truth, Bernardo would much prefer to be riding northwards directly to Rimas, not chasing ogres to the south. Both the city and the Holy Church of Moor had been in turmoil since before his election to the Archlectorship, and even more so now. There had been a civil war of sorts fought upon the city streets, in which the fanatical and schismatical Disciplinati di Moor had seized real control of the city. As the church's chosen ruler, Bernardo should be there to guide his flock, heal the divisions tearing the Moorite clergy apart, and ensure Moor's protective presence. Duarte and all his other advisers agreed, however, that the situation was now so bad there was little he could do without an army to back him which meant travelling wherever the Riemann captain-general, Duke Scaringella, and his army went. When Bernardo did finally return to Rimas, not only did he need the army with him, but he needed its loyalty. While the Archlector Calictus II had died at Abino, fighting against the vampire Duchess, Duke Scaringella had been leading a small army eastwards to join with Pavonan forces, hoping to defeat Razga Boldegut's double army of ogres before they reached Rimas. At the ruinous city of Astiano, the Duke had rendezvoused with the joint force of Riemanns and Pavonans sent away from the Holy Army by the Archlector a little while before his disastrous defeat. This was the force Bernardo had himself commanded as it marched south. Then, knowing he still had insufficient forces to fight the ogres, the Duke had waited, allowing Boldegut's army to swing around the north of the city, travelling east to west. He was gambling that as the ogres had already raised Astiano, they would have little interest in doing battle there again, this time with no prospect of plunder, whilst praying that the main Pavonan army would reach him in time before the ogres tore Rimas apart. It was a big risk, which nearly every one of the Duke's officers advised against, even if they could not agree what alternative action should be taken. His inactivity meant the very force that he had been sent to stop had got between him and what he was meant to be protecting. Luckily, just as news came that the Riemann town of Stiani had already been razed to the ground and it looked like the entire realm might soon be destroyed, Duke Guidobaldo Gondi arrived at the head of the main Pavonan army. 
Not that they had had to march far, but presumably it had taken some time to prepare such an army for any sort of march. It was a force stronger than Scaringellas, made bigger still when the Pavonans who had come south from Viadaza rejoined their comrades. Several days later, the Duke's only surviving son, Lord Silvano, one of the very few who had escaped the terrible defeat at Abino, also arrived to be reunited with his father. Then, in an even more welcome and entirely unexpected development, the army scouts reported that for reasons known only to the ogres, the tyrant Rasga Boldeguts and his mercenary ally Mangler had turned southwards rather than striking directly towards Remus, where the real wealth lay. Had they overestimated the forces defending Remus's mighty walls? Were they entirely ignorant of the debilitating turmoil inside the city? Were they making for the coast and some awaiting ships? Was the sudden change of direction part of a secret agreement with the vampire duchess? Or were they merely taking a detour? Whatever the reason, the Allied army now had a chance to do battle with the ogres before they wreaked any further destruction upon the realm. Other than the clattering of their lairs of steel armour, the dwarves marched in silence. They were armed with short spears, of a sort that could be used as a blade like a short sword, but were better at thrusting out between the interlocked iron of a shield wall. The dwarves had become a common sight on the streets of Remus, and since their incorporation into the city's standing army, the dwarven quarter had swelled considerably in size. There had been mutterings in the army, that the dwarfs would surely be unhappy about allying with the Pavonan army, what with the Duke Guidobaldo's hateful expulsion of every dwarf from his own realm only two years previously. The dwarfs themselves, however, were silent regarding the matter. Bernardo suspected that rather than anger, they were concealing mirth, secretly satisfied at the Pavonan soldier's discomfort. If the Pavonans disliked merely camping and marching beside dwarfs, then what did they make of the prospect of relying on them in battle? Perhaps the dwarfs intended to shame the Pavonans with their sturdy prowess and hardy discipline upon the field of battle. It was late in the afternoon, which on any other march would mean the army should be halting soon. Not this army, though. If the last four days were anything to go by, they would march until it grew properly dark. Ogre legs were longer than those of men. Catching up with them, would require going above and beyond normal practice. Despite being distracted by the discomfort of riding a mule, the traditional mount for lectors and arch-lectors, and worrying about the forthcoming battle, Bernardo had been attempting to think clearly about the situation in Remus, to decide upon his best course of action. He had learned of his election only two days ago, the news being delivered by a lowly but respected and trusted priest named Benvenuto, who had killed his horse in his haste to arrive. Benvenuto also described the recent violent events in the city. Since then, due to the consequences of the civil unrest, the speed of the Allied army's march and the fact that the army of ogres ahead were burning a path through the realm, killing and eating just about everyone they encountered, he had learned nothing new. Still, what he already knew was enough to fill him with concerns. Brother Duarte, he asked the young cleric riding beside him. Do you think Father Caradalio will harm the overlord? As usual, Duarte did not answer immediately. He was a careful, disciplined thinker of a philosophical bent and not one to rush to answer, even when asked by the arch-lector himself. It seems to me, Your Holiness, that Father Caradalio will be furious at not being elected, especially when he had already acted as if he were arch-lector. He'd played his hand in seizing the city, blood flowing in every street. Without the legitimization of election, he is no more than a heretical revolutionary. And rather than being the city's saviours, his disciplinati are revealed to be little more than a rebellious mob, overthrowing the rightful order. Until the election, all had gone well for him, presumably the result of planning and preparation. Now, however, he has been forced to think on his feet, to act more rashly. He has gone so far, it is too late to retreat. This makes him desperate. If he could have taken you hostage, Your Holiness, then I think he would have done so. Instead, 
he took Overlord Matusi, the next best thing. But I do not think he will harm the Overlord. Not now his fury has had time to abate. Besides, if he can manipulate the Overlord, allowing the rule of the realm by decree and not just force and fear, then he will be harder to displace. The Overlord is thus useful to him. Bernardo had already been thinking along similar lines. Two years previously, Overlord Matuzzi had handed over the reins of secular power to Calictus II, Bernardo's predecessor, making him ruler of both church and state. Until the election, the big debate had been whether or not the new Archlector would automatically inherit that secular authority. Now, however, a third player had entered the game. So you believe, asked Bernardo, that Caradalio intends to persuade the Overlord to yield authority to him? I think so, Your Holiness. He already has the city, as well as the fealty of nearly all the lower clergy. The people's fear of the vampires in the north means he most likely has the citizens' hopes also. If he also succeeds in expropriating the Overlord's authority, then he may have no need of the arch lectorship, which would make me a ceremonial puppet while Caradalio wields the real power, suggested Bernardo. Perhaps, he thought to himself, a demigod like Caradalio and his fanatical disciplinati are exactly what Remus needs. He himself had witnessed how a great many fled from the undead at Pontremola. The final victory had been gained by General D'Alessio's bravery and skill alone. Surely it would be better to have a whole army able to face and fight such terrible foes than rely on the bravery of a few heroes. Only the previous evening, young Lord Silvano had recounted the battle at Abino to him. There, as the army also broke and fled in panic fear, the mob of Morite flagellants had plunged deep into the enemy's line, to die fighting to the very last, despite the multitude of monstrous horrors in the Duchess's army. What could a whole army of such fanatics do? Perhaps such warriors were Tylia's only real chance against the vampires. Bernardo missed Father Biagino's counsel. That man had possessed both the gift of prophecy and a mind sharp enough to avoid ill-informed assumptions. Last night, when he had asked Lord Silvano what he knew of Biagino's fate, the young noble simply said he had neither seen nor heard of the priest since the battle, and so thought it most likely he perished among the multitude. "'Are you well, Your Holiness?' asked Duarte. The Archlector had been so deep in thought he had not realised the impression he was giving. His brow furrowed as he rubbed it with his hand. "'Yes, brother,' he said. "'It has been a long day. That is all. Pray thee, we shall stop a moment.' Duarte gave the command, and those fore and after of the Archlector came to a halt, while the parallel column of dwarfs continued its march. Bernardo turned his mule to face the two priests on foot behind, and Brother Duarte followed suit. Father Benvenuto, asked the Archlector, do you know why the lectors voted for me? I would not presume to say, Your Holiness, answered the priest, apart from to accept that whatever their reasons, it was ultimately Moore's will. Benvenuto wore a grey hooded cloak, and despite his sturdily built frame, leaned ponderously, bent-backed upon a staff. The heavy leather bags hanging at his waist were at least partially to blame, but he would not allow them to be put on the cart. When the priest had reached in to withdraw the letters he was carrying, Bernardo had glimpsed a weighty tome also within, its dark leather embossed with gold leaf. A holy book, or perhaps a ledger of some kind. Bernardo assumed he would discover the truth should Father Benvenuto ever feel the need to employ it. Moore's will, yes, said Bernardo. Then I pray I shall live up to his expectations. Still, Presently we abide in the mortal world, and it is men I must measure, not the majesty of more. So, father, if you were to hazard your best guess, what would you say was their motive? To speak plain, it is fear, your holiness. They fear Father Caradalio and his fanatics. If so, then why choose me in particular? asked Bernardo. Surely there are several lectors just as capable of putting Caradalio in his place. Maybe so, your holiness said the old priest, but they also fear the vampires. You are the only one amongst them who has met the undead armies in battle. You guided the Viadazan crusaders to their victory at Pontremola. Yet Viadaza, my own see, was lost that very same week. 
interrupted Bernardo. He felt no joy at the irony. Father Benvenuto had not finished. And then, Your Holiness, you were by collector's aside when Viadaza was retaken and cleansed. You were thus part of not one, but two great victories. In the first, the vampire duke perished, and in the second, you chased Lord Adolfo from your city. The lectors want a proven soldier of more leading the church, and Rimas in the great fight, not an untried rabble-rouser like Caradalio, whose only proven propensity is to threaten the proper order. That might well be. Yet Viadaza has most likely fallen once more, this time for good, which makes me the lector of nowhere. By your leave, your holiness, said Duarte, the lectors may well have been counting on its fall. If Viadaza was lost, then there would be nothing to distract you from defending Rimas. I have heard them whisper that Calictus was distracted by the ogres, and so erred by dividing Rimas's army, himself marching north with only a portion there to be defeated. At that battle, half those serving him were Arabian mercenaries who barely knew Moore's name. They weren't even under contract to Rimas, rather to Porto Maggiore, and they fled the field long before the battle was decided. Now Stiani has been raised, because Duke Scaringella was left with far too small a force to stop the ogres. The lectors yearn for decisive action and definitive victories. If I might speak, Your Holiness? asked Brother Marsilio, the grey-robed monk who had accompanied Father Benvenuto from Rimas. The lectors knew you were with the Captain General. Once the brute's double army is defeated, then both you and he will return at the head of a victorious army. How could Caradalio's screeching sermons compete with the commands of Moore's anointed pontiff? How could his crazed followers stand against a veteran army? Ah, thought Bernardo, but what sort of force will we really return with? If we are badly mauled in this coming battle, we may be left with only the battered rump of an army. And even if sufficient force survived to contend with the Disciplinati's fanatics, would Duke Scaringella do the right thing and restore the proper order? When he spoke... He hid all sign of these doubts from his voice. After you delivered your news to me, Father Benvenuto, you spoke with the Captain General, yes? I did, Your Holiness, the priest answered. I take it he questioned you concerning Remus, inquired Bernardo. At length, Your Holiness, and he kept me there while he spoke to his officers, that I might answer whatever else he and they thought to ask. And I was given to understand that I should not speak of what I had heard. Although Bernardo had seen the Captain General since that meeting, when both Scaringella and Duke Guidobaldo came to receive his official blessing as the new Moorite Archlector, he had not yet had the opportunity to speak properly and privately with Scaringella. He doubted the General would want to discuss the precarious state of Riemann affairs in the Pavonan's presence, especially in light of the unexpected delay, lasting the best part of a day which occurred the previous week. During that day, as they waited for the Pavonans, Scaringella had, however, briefly confided to Pernardo his suspicion that Duke Guidobaldo did not actually intend to fight the ogres and was instead considering some other action. Perhaps the Captain General had the real measure of Duke Guidobaldo of Pavona. Yet he also admitted he could not fathom why Guidobaldo would consider allowing those who had injured him so badly to escape. Fearing his dangerous gamble had failed, Scaringella had knelt to pray with Bernardo for Remus, pleading with Moore not to allow it to suffer at the hands of brutes when the most holy work of destroying the vampires was yet to be done. That evening, however, Duke Guidobaldo called a council of war, giving no explanation at all for the delay, and simply declared that they would immediately recommence the pursuit. Duke Guidobaldo possessed the larger force, and so, according to traditional custom, considering he and Scaringella were of noble rank, he should have precedence in the chain of command. Yet he did not claim it, nor did Duke Scaringella offer to swear obedience to Duke Guidobaldo, being himself of equal noble rank and a captain general, which suited him well in light of his distrust. Instead, he simply offered to fight at Duke Guidobaldo's side, promising to cooperate fully upon the field of battle, doing his utmost to contribute to victory. The matter of dividing the spoils was not discussed, for the chase was on and there was no time to waste. The soldiers seemed to presume that as most of the plunder came from Pavonan settlements, then the Pavonans would receive the lion's share. 
Considering Duke Scaringella's religiosity and apparent acceptance of spiritual authority, Bernardo had every reason to think that Scaringella's command concerning Father Benvenuto's silence was more to prevent the Pavonans' learning of his concerns. In light of this, he made the Morite sign and spoke. I hereby absolve you of any promise you made to keep silent. As your pontiff, I command that you answer me. Father Benvenuto nodded his acceptance. Did Lord Scaringella voice his opinion concerning Father Caradaglio and his dedicants? Bernardo asked. He spoke of little else, Your Holiness, and was in quite a dilemma. He must defend Remas, of course, either by destroying the ogres or chasing them away. His victory must be glorious, so he can return to Remas as a hero, winning the citizens' favour. He must earn a good portion of the loot so he can feed and pay the army, and he must prove to be so effective on the field of battle that the Pavone and Duke is grateful, becoming an important ally during the struggle ahead. Yet, he must do all these things without suffering significant losses, for he will need the entire army to defeat the Disciplinati de More upon our return to Remas. More than that, Duarte added, we need the army to fight the vampires. Brute ogres, fanatics and the undead thought Bernardo. Not one, but three wars to be fought. Brethren, he said, let us contend with one thing at a time. Tonight we shall pray for victory against the brutes. <laughs>